All right, well, hello everyone. And um, I'm excited tonight to uh, be presenting uh, Bob Allen and his crew from um, um, his students that are surveying the flora of Casper's Wilderness Park. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're all uh, seeing uh, what we have here, yep. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to uh, begin by introducing uh, Bob and then he's gonna turn around, I think, and introduce his students uh, a little later and talk about how the project uh, originated. And they're gonna talk about um, everything that they found there. So um, when I uh, approached the Orange County chapter about co-presenting and I copied some people I knew there, Bob was the one to immediately say, I can do this, I can do this, I'm ready when you are. Um, we love that kind of enthusiasm. So we got him on the schedule and asked him to, to suggest a topic from his great accumulation of knowledge. He said that he could talk about a survey that began earlier this year in Casper's Wilderness Park. Casper's, which I've never been to, uh, but I'll be going here tonight, is described as, in the travel brochures, nestled among the river terraces and sandstone canyons of the western coastal Santa Ana Mountains. Uh, Bob is known as Bug Bob Allen, since insects are one of his largest field to focus, and that has been since childhood. The Santa Ana Mountains have uh, been his stomping ground since that time. He is the lead author with Fred Roberts of Wildflowers of Orange County in the Santa Ana Mountain, Mountains. He teaches college biology classes and local workshops in entomology, botany, and photography. He was awarded research associate in entomology at the Natural History Museum in, in LA County and at the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, now known as the California Botanic Garden. Tonight, we are joined by some of his students known as Bug Bob's Flying Circus. You know someone is serious about their circuses when they design a logo for it. Uh, this here is in 3D. And uh, we are, uh, so I, I, uh, a couple things about the, uh, the Zoom room. We have two features that you'll find uh, on your screen. And one is a chat where you can just post anything you want, hellos, comments, um, um, compliments, and, uh, and talk with each other in, in the room. Uh, however, if you want to post a question, you're going to want to put it in the feature called Q&A. And throughout the presentation, Bob's going to take a look at those and answer some of them live. So I now will vanish from the screen and I will turn this over to Bob and his flying circus of students. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joseph. Hey, everybody. All right, circus, everybody wave. Everybody watching? Okay, let me dive on into our presentation so we could chat. Uh, before I do that, I almost forgot. If you have a question or comment, go ahead and put it in the Q&A, we'll try to get to it during the talk. It's okay to ask things during the talk. I like that better, honestly. So we'll do our best to answer it. Our project's not done yet, so we will not have all the answers, but we're gonna try, right? So let's dive on in and here we are. Hopefully everybody can see that. Okay. So let's head on in. So this is, Ronald W. Casper's Wilderness Park. It's our flora project. It's up here in Orange County. For those of you in San Diego, we're your friendly neighbors to the north. And if you're up in Northern California, we're your friendly neighbors to the very far south. Alrighty, so we're gonna show you a few of the characters that are working on this project and have a little fun. Here we go. So there's a number of people working on this. Fred Roberts, many people in CMPS know Fred. Uh, Rebecca Crow, who's the um, herbarium curator at UC Irvine, Jillian Stevens on the project, Kyle Gunther, James Bailey, Ron Vanderhoff, and Professor Mike Simpson, retired from San Diego State. Alrighty, and here is the Flying Circus. We have Megan Poikert, Maddie Letterman, Kristen Elkers, Louis Trong, Maddie Letterman again. How'd she get in there twice? Elora Camacho and Jem Sizem. 
These are our presenters right here. And here are our topics. So I'm going to give you a little introduction to the park. Maddie will talk to you about plant communities and more about the project itself and how to press plants. Jim will talk about rare and unusual species and some monkey flowers, because who doesn't love monkey flowers? Louie will talk about live forevers and daughters. Megan about sages. Maddie about lilies. And then I'll summarize it. And that'll be it for the evening. So sit back and relax and enjoy. So a little bit on the setting. I'll talk to you a little bit about that, a little bit about the history. There's the actual park brochure. I'm not gonna walk you through that. So here is an outline of Orange County where we're known mostly for this little place where some little guy wears these funny round ears. It opened in 1955 or 56. Yep, we're talking Disneyland. But we're not that far from Disneyland. All my overseas friends, if I tell them I live just south of Disneyland, amazingly, they know where it is. So Casper's is in the southern part of the county, not far from Mission San Juan Capistrano. In fact, Casper's Park is very close to the original location of the mission when it was first established. All right, so there's our county and we've got a lot of open space around. It's really close to the Tribuco District of the Cleveland National Forest. Those of you in San Diego County are well aware that the uh, Cleveland National Forest has three different parts that are not attached to each other. We are in the northernmost one. Um, to compare the size of this place, I give you just a few numbers. Irvine Ranch Conservancy here in central Orange County is about 50,000 acres. Rancho Mission Viejo is about 17,000 acres. It's right down here. Uh, Chino Hills State Park up this way, about 14,000 acres. Casper's Wilderness Park is a county-owned park, and it's 8,000 acres, which just blows me away. Laguna Coast Wilderness Park down here is about 7,000 acres, pretty huge. Crystal Cove State Park, just under 4,000 acres. So we've got some really big open spaces here locally. Little history. In uh, the late 1700s, San Juan Hot Springs, used by the Hashiwan, our Native Americans in this area, uh, was used for a long time by them. Well, when the missionaries came in, they claimed it as part of the mission, and people would come from the mission in San Juan out to the hot springs and bathe in the hot springs. Uh, in the 1840s, Juan Forster, his real name, John Forster, he changed his name to sound Hispanic, uh, he purchased Rancho Mission Viejo. Uh, in uh, 1927, Eugene Grant Starr, who's an oil man, bought over 10,000 acres of the ranch, uh, used the hot springs as well, had cattle, used it as a gentleman's retreat. In 1973, first off, he died in 1963. In 1973, his family deeded the northern 3,900 acres to the Audubon Society. It's now a sanctuary called Star Ranch. Beautiful place, go there. Uh, you, you need uh, reservations ahead of time, but go there, it's great. Northwest 873 acre parcel was sold and now it's very expensive custom homes called uh, Dove Canyon. The southern 5,500 acres were sold to developers. They were gonna put in a motorcycle and amusement park and luckily they crashed and burned. Um, stories say they went bankrupt. I'm not sure that's the story, but that's what the legend is. 1974, Orange County bought those 5,500 acres for $4.4 million. That's $800 an acre. Wow, to have those prices. And they named it Star Viejo Regional Park. But in 74, not long after Supervisor Caspers, who led the charge to buy it, was lost at sea, so they renamed the park after him. From the 70s to the present, they did acquire more property, and now it's 8,000 acres of beautiful wilderness. So if, to, if you wanna go there, you've gotta go along the five freeway, uh, from the coast anyway, and hit Mission San Juan Capistrano, which itself is a beautiful place to visit, and head out Highway 74. It's about six miles out, and there we are, we're at Casper's Park. It's a really nice place. And then, here it is, right north of a place that we like to call Tree of Life Nursery. What CNPS member doesn't know that? Here. Flying Circus Crew, anybody been there? Oh yeah, of course we have. Okay, so the park is right about there. Let me outline it for you. It's here, and uh, the Orange County Riverside line is not far away. And... Here again, Ortega Highway goes right through it. That's State Highway 74, right through the middle of the park. So it really is a west and an east part. 
the western part has a lot of trails and amenities like bathrooms, showers, uh, water, camping, day use, picnicking, stables, all kinds of great stuff, and a lot of wilderness. The eastern part is all wilderness. There really aren't very many established trails. It has two major watersheds, San Juan Creek on the east in this on the right hand side in this drawing, and Bell Canyon and its creek on the uh, western side of this, and they come together. The green are established trails, and like I said, there are very few trails on the eastern part. A lot of good trails here, fantastic park. Um, this gives you a little bit more labeling, not going to go into detail. All right, I'd like to introduce now Maddie Letterman will talk to us about plant communities. Take it away. Hi, I'm Maddie. Um, so I'm going to be talking about plant communities. Uh, the main ones that we have in Caspers are riparian, alluvial scrub, coastal sage scrub, chaparral, southern California grasslands, and southern oak woodland. So we'll go uh, through that. So this photo is a really good representation of alluvial scrub. And then to the left hand side is a uh, riparian. So a big indicator species, two indicator species of alluvial scrub are scale broom, which is labeled, and California buckwheat, which is also labeled. Um, when we see that, uh, especially scale broom, that's definitely an indicator to show that it, we are in alluvial scrub. It uh, is really adjacent to riparian areas. So when we are in alluvial scrub, we are constantly going back and forth between riparian and alluvial. This is within the San Juan Creek. So when uh, Bob was showing that map. It's uh, very close to the 74. Right. Uh, this next one is, oh, yeah, you can go to the next one. Okay, cool. So another uh, very dominant uh, habitat within Caspers, this is the most dominant within all the habitats, uh, is coastal sage scrub. And we see a lot of this. Uh, the main plants that are within this photo are white sage, sagebrush, there's lemonade berry, some uh, California buckwheat. There's also some uh, daughter that California daughter that's on buckwheat over here, and that would only be around uh, during springtime and uh, a little bit now, but it's starting to dry out. And you can go to the next one. So this is showing going down. Uh, so the hilltops and the lowlands. So this is going down, and you can definitely see just how dense uh, the California sage scrub is. And you can see the difference between uh, the green and the drier parts, which are the lighter parts between uh, the northern facing and the southern facing. So the southern facing are gonna have a lot lighter colors uh, so that they can be in sunlight a lot more and capture or less water. And then the green will obviously be in shadier areas and need a little bit more water. And we can go to the next slide. Andy, we've actually got some questions. How about if we oh. uh, hit those right now? Uh, people read can... Oh, but you want to read it? Not... Your... Yeah. So the first question is: Are people permitted to explore the eastern side of the park? Uh, I don't know that answer. Bob, do you want to take that? They are. However, the ranger would like to know if someone's over there. It doesn't require a special permit or anything. They just want to have an idea if someone's there, just because it's more difficult for them to access in case there is an emergency you are allowed to go over there. And then the next question is, do you know if alluvial scrub is found much further south than Caspers? Do you want to take that one too, Bob? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure it's in San Diego County as well. It, it's just going to be in places where you know, there was, was an active wash or there's an active wash. And there, there are actually old benches above the active channel. As you can see from our photos, some dry places. It really doesn't get active flow anymore but it's often got the same soil, like sand and uh, uh, particles and, and some gravel, some uh, fist-sized boulders usually too. So it drains very quickly. Okay, awesome. Uh, and then we can go to the next slide. Okay. Oh, was there another question? Thank you, okay. <laughs> um, and then this is just another photo um, going down into the lowlands. Um, from the coastal sage scrub. And I believe this is on the Eastern Ridge Trail that was taken. Um, and so it's just kind of going down. You can see the other side of the park from this photo. And we can go to the next one. Okay, this slide is looking west. Oh, it's looking and, west. My bad. Yeah, and so you're right. That's on the other side. We're on the East Ridge Trail. We took this okay. photo. We're looking at the West Ridge Trail. So 
Uh, yeah, we're looking west, just a, a tad northwest, but west. You can see that's Bell Canyon in the, dif the distance. Just a beautiful place. And there are plenty of trails going through that too. Um, and then we have another question. It says, is it more common in desert in San Diego County? That's I, the question. I don't know what he's I don't think it's to. a question. I think he said it is more common in desert. Oh, it is more common. Okay. Yeah, it, it is, it is, it can be kind of a desert community. We don't have true desert in Orange County. I know San Diego does. Um, I'm jealous. I'd love to have Borrego, Hans Borrego in my backyard. Um, but it's not really a total desert community here. It's kind of fun that we get it here, um, really close to the coast. This spot is about five miles from the beach. We are not far from the ocean at all here. And then this is just another photo of coastal sage scrub. Uh, you can see that there is black sage here, which is another very dominant plant within coastal sage scrub. And also the sagebrush and possibly, uh, this is probably a lemonade berry, a laurel sumac. So just, that's just what the common plants are within this plant community. And we can go to the next slide. And Maddie, doesn't it look like it burned at some point in the past? Yeah, there's also some scarification on here um, of from uh, of past fire. Um, and so these are plants that will come up after post fire. And then we can go to the next one. And this is another really good photo um, showing alluvial scrub uh, adjacent to riparian and uh, south oak woodland and also with coastal sage scrub. So these communities uh, really intersect with each other and are very closely impacted to each other. Um, so there's this, it's within the San Juan Creek again. Uh, you can see that uh, there, so the active channel is within the riparian and there used to be an active channel within this alluvial scrub, but obviously it is dried up now and not there. Um, but when it does get a little bit more wet and uh, there is more rain within winter time when we do get rain, um, there can be streams that do come through here, but obviously within this time then we were here around May, June, uh, there weren't any active streams within this area. Um, and yeah, we can go to the next one, unless there's anything else. Okay. And then another uh, dominant, or not dominant, but another uh, habitat that's there is chaparral. Uh, in the area that we've been vouchering, uh, we don't see chaparral as much because it's in a uh, higher elevation areas. Um, so we've been working mainly in lower elevation. But a uh, very dominant uh, species that's within chaparral is chemise. So you can see right here the close up picture. It's uh, white flowers, uh, very waxy leaves, uh, very hardy. And then in the larger photo, you can see a little bit more dried out uh, with the summer months and the hotter times of the year. And yeah, we can go to the next slide. What does the one degree mean? Uh, that means primarily. Okay, sorry, there's questions. Okay. Um, okay, when referring to a plant, please point out where the plant, okay. Um, I'm doing that now. Okay, cool, thank you. And then uh, what are the main elements of alluvial scrub? Um, so uh, as, Bob's, as Bob said earlier, um, it's areas that uh, may have used to be or were uh, streams and a little bit dried out now. Um, the areas have sandy and silty soil, um, very rocky too, and it's adjacent to riparian, so they do have, a, can have a little bit more riparian plants, but not usually, and uh, the scale broom is a very good indicator, so uh, scale broom uh, is a plant that um, kind of thinner, um, yeah, we'll have a picture of that. Yeah, so the scale broom is to the left right here. It's labeled. Um, closer up, it's uh, light green, and it, it looks like scale, so hence the name scale broom. Um, but that's one of the main indicators, that plant, when you're in alluvial. Yeah, so it's kind of scattered throughout the photo. And I don't know if there's anything else that I need to say about alluvial scrub. How about California buckwheat? Yeah, and the California buckwheat is another one. And that one also is a part of coastal sage scrub. So that's kind of, as it shifts into coastal sage scrub, you'll see the buckwheat going in within that habitat too. Okay, let me catch up where we were. Oh, another question. 
Can you yeah, Tori, explain I'm about your specimens and collections you are doing? Um, I believe that Alora is going to be going over uh, vouchers and specimens after me, so uh, you'll get a better answer there. And the Latin name is um, Lepido uh, Sparta. I, I'm not entirely sure what's the. I know I know like parts of it. <laughs> you got it, Lepido Spartum Squamatum. Okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, and then this is um, a picture that Bob took when we were out doing vouchering and samples. And there, out in the distance, you can see myself, Lewis, Jem, and Alora. We're looking at uh, Matillaha poppy that's out there that's blooming. You can see like the little whites of it, the flowers. And uh, you can see that the person walking up on the trail, uh, that's the East Ridge Trail. So we did some collections up there as well. And it's 20 million year old sandstone. Um, it's really beautiful, like in person, it's great. And then uh, down here, we see the San Juan Canyon and Creek. Uh, so the river or the creek was running when we were doing this. So it was very wet. And then as you can, so as we go from the top of the East Ridge and you go down, we see coastal sage scrub. And then from there, we go to low and riparian woodland. So that's gonna be a little bit more wet. And then with the Southern Oak woodland, so that's gonna be um, a lot of uh, oaks. And then we go down to alluvial scrub. And then we can go to the next slide. And then there's a question. I lived in Silverado Canyon for about a year and noticed several old large oak trees, which suddenly fell over in the canyon and up on Maple Springs. Is this happening in Casper's? Do you know the cause? I personally yes. do not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, because of the extended drought we had, it killed off thousands of oaks in our area. Um, I know that there's golden spotted oak borer in other places in, um, in Southern California. We don't have it in Orange County. At least it's not widespread, fingers crossed. But the, all the, the uh, coastal live oak deaths, the massive ones are uh, either drought or the prolific shock hole borer beetle. That's also taken out a lot, a lot of them. <clears throat> so probably Silverado, that's, that's what happened there. Okay, and this next habitat is Southern California grasslands. So uh, personally, our group, we have not been within the grasslands doing vouchers yet, but uh, there are some good spots and uh, some uh, with native grasslands that uh, there has been some um, damage to them because of uh, cattle and ranching within this area. So uh, this area does have native species like uh, purple needle grass, and then this photo to the left, uh, school bells. Um, so school bells aren't there right now. Um, it's too hot for them. They are done flowering for now, but uh, this is a really great grassland to go visit. I personally have not been here yet, but I would love to go. Um, but yeah, so we can go to the next slide. And then this next habitat is Southern Oak Woodland. Um, it's mainly coast live oak that's here. Um, we do have a few Engelman oaks that are within the park, um, but they're not very closely together. Um, there, there's a few that are, but uh, some of them are sporadic throughout the park. There's one that's like on the east side and then on the west side that there are there. Um, and then there's a question, where was that grasslands on the map? Um, Bob, you, don't answer that. If you take the East Ridge Trail, uh, just keep going north. You so find the, the Casper's Park. I don't want to go back to that slide. Uh, you just go get their map and you just take the East Ridge Trail, which we're looking at here. This is a bluff. The East Ridge Trail is on top of that bluff. And you just keep going north and it runs right into the grassland. Can't miss it. Okay. And then we can go to the next slide. And then Alora is going to be going over uh, recording and all of that. So I'll take it to Alora. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dad. Uh, my name is Alora. I will be talking a little bit more about the Flora project that we've been working on and uh, how we've been recording data and how we've been pressing the plants specifically, including a video that I recorded of exactly how to do that and how we've been doing that in the field. Um, so just to discuss a little bit more about the project that we're working on, we're collecting specimens uh, for University of California, Irvine. Uh, their 
uh, herbarium that they have. And an herbarium is a museum for plant specimens that have been dried out and preserved. And uh, so we are collecting the plants that are in the Casper's Wilderness Park. And we were mainly trying to voucher areas that were previously didn't have a lot of data and didn't have a lot of recording. And so we've been uh, collecting data by doing field work. So we have been going into the field. Um, a few of us uh, once a week or so would go into Casper's together and we would um, collect plants, uh, take some notes about where we found the plants, the neighboring um, plants that are in that area, what, um, uh, what habitat it was found in, and we would take GPS coordinates to show exactly where, where we had found the specimen. And um, Maddie took a lot of our extensive notes on um, where we found the plants and exactly what they were, their descriptions and everything, which would go into our labeling. And, um, and We've been taking, trying to take specimens in the late spring once all the wildflowers are flowering so that we can get kind of an adequate um, specimen with flowers, leaves, and root as well if it's available. And, um, and I just have some notes, I'm a little nervous. Um, and we have been recording all the data into the California Consortium of Herbarium version two, so the CCH2 uh, website. So if we could go to the next slide. And uh, here's, we're gonna start with some photos of all of us doing the field work that we've been doing. So this is a photo of myself, Jem and Lewis and uh, from the other day. And um, there was a question. Oh, never mind, it's gone. Okay. Um, yeah, if we could go to the next slide. And this is a, a photo of Jem, Megan, and Maddie on another day uh, when we got to do some field work. And um, I, I'm drawing a blank on what uh, those red, the red flowers are, the red plant right there. Uh, Jem's going to tell us about those. Okay, great. Later. So, Later. okay, perfect. Okay, we could go to the next slide. And this is a photo of us um, by a I believe it was a female juniper that we had been looking high and low for, and uh, we found it right off, to the, uh, uh, right off of the East Bridge Trail, and uh, we had missed it. It's right next to the trail, so uh, we, were, we spotted it eventually, and so uh, this is Lewis, Maddie, myself, and Jem, and um, okay, if we could go to the next picture. So that's Bob in the background. This is a photo that I took. So this is a photo of Bob, Maddie, and Jem. And this is on the East Ridge Trail. And we're, uh, I believe we're looking at um, old dried up Mariposa lilies right there and uh, some uh, California cactus on the side. And I think Lewis is back in that picture as well. I can't see him very well, but yes. <laughs> he pointed that out to me the other day when we were practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Lewis. Lewis was there too. And I forgot to put a little label on him. <laughs> yes, Lewis is featured, Lewis is there. So this is a map of where uh, there's already been vouchering and data taken in the park. And so um, uh, I believe on this is where the East Ridge Trail is. And so we have been uh, up on there as well as the San Juan Canyon and Creek area. And um, I can't quite read what that says, but it's, okay. it's it's off of Ortega Highway and uh, the Casper's Park is quite large. And so we haven't been able to um, survey all of it, obviously, but um, did you want to add anything about that, Bob? Well, we're only one team. There is another team and some of them are watching right now. And like Ron and Mike have been kicking some notes in here and there. And um, yeah, so we're not the only ones collecting. A lot of people have collected here and then I've collected since I was like 13 years old. So some of my old records are here. Some of Fred Roberts records are here. Anyway, the, the dots are just intended to show where vouchers have been taken uh, more all the time. Yes, research is ongoing. Okay, so this is a picture of us uh, placing the specimens into the field press. And so I'll go into more detail about how we press, press plants, excuse me. But um, I, as you can see, we've taken, uh, 
those plants there. Again, I'm drawing a blank on what those are exactly, but um, we took about as much as we need to fill up a page of our um, newspaper so that we can fit it inside of the uh, field press. And we uh, contain all of the specimens that we take out in the field and hike back to the car where we have our standard press. And then we just put the whole thing into the standard press so it can dry out properly. And this is a picture of all four of us, uh, minus Bob, um, myself, Maddie, Jem, and Lewis on the day we, that we hiked east, the East Ridge Trail. Okay, I'm gonna interject real quick. Somebody raised their hand, not us, and then it disappeared. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the q and I'm monitoring the q and I've got all these different windows open and I can't monitor everything. Also, if you're on YouTube, uh, I can't monitor that at the same time as I'm monitoring all of this too. I just, I can't, <laughs> I've got too many windows. So if you, if you have a question uh, and you're on YouTube, go ahead and ask it. Uh, Joe, if you could read off uh, some of those once in a while, if you think it has to do with the slide that we're on or the presenter that's on, and then we'll try to do it that way. So that was kind of the deal. I'm monitoring um, Zoom. And then I forgot to ask Joe if he would monitor um, YouTube questions. I'm happy to send those over. All right, thank you. Okay, um, I believe that this is a picture, uh, again, demonstrating how we press plants in the field. So um, we've taken the specimen and we would just sandwich it between newspaper before putting it in with the blotting paper and the cardboard. And I'll explain that in much greater detail in the video that, okay, here we go. This is the video. There it is. I, um, Hi everyone, my name is Elora and I'll be demonstrating how to press plants this morning for us. So you will start with a sheet of cardboard followed by a sheet of blotting paper and a sheet of newspaper below that. We've been using one sheet of newspaper and just folding it in half to sandwich the specimen inside it. But in any case, you need uh, a sheet of newspaper on each side of the specimen. So this is a specimen of Cassalia that we collected in Casper's Wilderness Park. And the specimen needs to remain horizontal. So even while I'm demonstrating, I'm just gonna put it over here like this. So that's followed by another sheet of blotting paper and another piece of cardboard. So in total, you're going to have cardboard, blotting paper, newspaper, specimen, newspaper, blotting paper, cardboard. So typically in the field, we would carry this inside a field press and we I don't have one of those to show you, but in any case, I have the standard press that we use to press all of the specimens that we collect on the field. And this standard press is from UCI. So you can put those on top with all the other specimens. Place the wood on top. Which wrap. My lovely assistant is going to help me to tighten the straps. The straps need to be tightened every day for about two weeks to make sure all the moisture is out of the plants to prevent any mold and so that they can be properly preserved. So it helps to have a second person to stand on them in order to make sure that the straps can be tightened as much as possible. And this again just helps with the drying out process. Okay. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> that was a great video. <laughs> yes, it took a few tries to get that video. And uh, that was the best one that came out, like lighting wise and information wise. And that's, of course, the one that my cat decided to make a cameo on. So I hope everyone enjoyed the wildlife that lives in my house. And um, so moving on, thank you for watching my video. Um, so um, the way the plant specimens work is that we collect them, like I said, ideally when they're flowering uh, with uh, leaves and um, if available, we uh, could take the root as well if possible. And so that was how you press the plants ideally. And um, so, like I said, we would carry them in the field press from out in the field, hike back to the car and take it to the standard press, the uh, wooden thing from UCI. And uh, that's how they dry out. And then uh, as far as the mounting process, I 
am not familiar with how to mount them properly, but um, I uh, we've been you know making data labels and just kind of recording as we go the uh, information that we need to have to create these labels. And um, an herbarium, as I explained before, is a plant specimen museum. And so uh, the specimens we'll be taking will go into uh, University of California of Irvine's herbarium. And uh, each plant label just kind of explains the what, where, and when. So exactly what the plant is, exactly what it looks like uh, from the flowers, how many leaves there are, how many petals, how many corolla there are, um, and where and when it was taken. So the exact coordinates of where it was taken and a very exact description of where it is. And we input all of that information into the uh, CCH2 website that we've been using, the database that we've been using for UCI. So this picture, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. I don't know if it uh, zooms in a little bit more. It will. Okay. Beautiful, okay. So this is a specimen of juniper that was taken in 1934, January 13th, 1934 by um, Miss uh, Bryant. I don't know her, Susanna, Susanna Bixby Bryant, thank you. And um, she founded the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, uh, which as Bob explained earlier is the California Botanic Garden. Uh, I always appreciate other women in science and STEM, especially early on like this, it's fantastic. Um, but uh, this juniper uh, leading into the next slide is, uh, it's still there. Uh, junipers are uh, very long lived and um, uh, this juniper is still very much alive. Um, so this is the same plant that was collected by Susanna B Bryant in 1934. And um, it's in this coastal sage scrub um, habitat. And uh, that's the East Ridge Trail that's in the background where we had taken some other specimens. And um, in the back, uh, there is another female juniper, or no, male, excuse me, um, a male juniper plant that has probably been uh, seeded downwind from this same one. So yeah, it's just exciting to see the exact same plant almost a hundred years later. Mm -hmm. You have a question, Laura? Oh, okay. Um, what is the vine growing on the tree? It's, it, if I feel like that's um, a cucumber vine. Mm -hmm. seen. I don't know the exact species, but it smells to me like a cucumber vine. Yep, it's wild cucumber, Mara macrocarpa. Thank you, Bob. You've got another one. Are there any good plant and flower presses to buy for home or DIY method? Um, I haven't looked into them because we have had them, but I actually would like to make them. I am told that it's possible to do them, create them yourself, um, and it's quite a bit less expensive than buying them. Um, I'm told they're available online. I'm not sure from where. Bob, do you have any more information on that? Yes, there are a number of places to get plant presses. Some are better than others. The two best are made by Herbarium Supply. You can Google them, Herbarium Supply. You saw my field press, it was green, made by them. They make, per, um, they make standard presses and field presses and a lot of other supplies. And also BioQuip, they're uh, just near Long Beach, right off the 405 freeway, bioquip.com, B-I-O-Q-U-I-P.com. They make great plant presses. You can make your own, but you've got to be careful to make sure that air can flow through them. If you use solid pieces of wood to make the wood on the outside, um, if it's solid, it will keep the moisture in and that could actually mildew the specimens close to it. Um, another question there, I'm gonna go ahead and take this one. Have you considered using community science database like iNaturalist? Yes, iNaturalist is part of this project. There are a number of people in the project that document using iNaturalist as we go out through the field. Some members of my team do that, and I know members of the other teams do that as well, definitely. Um, we do have to have, science does require vouchers. We do have to have some vouchers from the park. We're not vouchering every plant we see or every 10 feet or something like that. You know, we're taking an appropriate number of vouchers. Uh, you have to have a voucher so that if you say something lives somewhere, you can prove it by showing a specimen of that plant. Um, very important for studies like this. 
especially lilies. That's a really important thing. Jim will get into lilies later on because very often people from north of Orange County will misidentify intermediate Mariposa lily and say that it's plumber's Mariposa lily, uh, which it's not. It doesn't live here. So specimens are very, very important, but iNatural is totally legit and we are using it. It's part of our, our process. Okay, and this is a screen cap of uh, the CCH2 website, the database that we use to uh, input all of our uh, information. So it has all the information about the project, um, who is um, authoring the research and um, all the things that we have added thus far into the database. And so that's still ongoing. I think we're still adding specimens as we go. And um, I don't even think we're done putting all the ones in that we've um, collected even so far. But um, as we uh, go out and take more uh, specimens, we continue to add to this. Okay, Laura, you want to go ahead and take the first question there and the second one, uh, maybe later. Explain what I mean by voucher. Um, I believe that, you know, it's just, I don't know the exact definition in terms of how we're using it, but we're taking specimens from a certain area and it's um, proving that this plant grows in this area and um, we list the other plants that are nearby and um, the, um, the exact location and where it was. Okay, so I'm sure, uh, Karen, I'm sure you know what a, what a specimen is. It's just taking part of something and preserving it. A scientific specimen is called a voucher specimen because you can vouch for someone, you can vouch for something being somewhere, you can back it up with a specimen. So in science, we have to have voucher specimens you know, because someone could misidentify something. So it just means specimen, it's a scientific specimen. That's all it is. Uh, the next person is asking something about oaks and oaks extinction. That is way beyond uh, the topic of our talk. Uh, Robert, CCH2 is California Consortium of um, Herbaria, version 2, which what you're looking at right now. Okay, moving on. Okay, right. and uh, Jem is going to go um, forward with some rare and unusual species that we have documented in the park and um, um, different things that we've found and gotten to look into. So um, Jem, take it away. Hello, can you guys see me? Yes. All right, so uh, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the rare and unusual plants that we find in, that we find in Casper's. So. Can, can I see the next slide? <clears throat> so Juniperus californica, or um, California juniper, we already saw this picture. Uh, it's in the Cupressaceae or the Cypress family. Uh, California juniper are multi-trunk, medium-sized coniferous trees that are of local concern. Uh, they're either completely female uh, with fleshy berry-like cones or their males, which uh, have seemingly dry ends to their scaly leaves. Uh, it is also unusual for the park to have Juniperus californica in the first place because it's very close to the coast uh, for Junipers to occur. Uh, in our case, these Junipers were taken less than eight miles from the coast. So uh, yeah, and this pic also shows the Merrimacca corpus. We already talked about that, but yeah, the man it's going on on the Juniper. So yeah. Say next when you want the next slide, okay? Yeah, okay. Next slide, please. Yeah, and that's showing me a female juniper we found, and those are the berries on it. Next slide, please. Fleshy cones, not berries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fleshy cones. <laughs> Cool, so this is a uh, desert deer weed, uh, Acmes pond labor, variation Brevia latus. So the desert deer weed is a desert variety of one of the most common shrubby perennials of Caspers, the coastal deer weed. Uh, they're of the lotus clay and the bean family Fabaceae. Uh, seemingly the only difference between the two varieties uh, is that the desert variety has a longer keel, which 
uh, Bob is pointing at with his cursor. Yeah, that's the bottom part. Uh, so we had to, yeah. The variation, uh, this variation of deer weed is found more inland and enjoy, enjoys dry soils. So uh, we had to look under a lot of coastal deer weed flowers until we found the single one we found, which was growing next to a stream where we weren't expecting to find it at all. So <laughs> yeah, uh, the keel hangs down like a banana. So it's uh, much more extended. There you go, cool. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, uh, this is Hoita macrostachys. Um, it is called leather root tea. It's also in the Fabaceae or the bean family. Uh, it's uncommon in our area, and we've seen them twice on our outings only this year. And yeah, they're uh, very uh, pretty tall perennial herbs. They grow about two meters tall, and they have clusters of beautiful purple flowers. Cool. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> All right, <laughs> this is Quercus Engelmanii or Engelman oak. It's in the Phagaceae or the oak family. Uh, they're generally evergreen but opportunistically drought deciduous trees, which are found mixed among coast live oaks in the park. So initially they can be kind of hard to spot. Uh, they have blue green leaves and generally grow to be smaller than coast live oaks. However, we have a few specimens or a few trees in the park that are really big, probably really old trees. Uh, this one I'm standing next to, uh, that's actually me taking a specimen. That rod has uh, sort of, uh, what's it called? <laughs> the scissors at the end of it, uh, <laughs> pruning shears, yeah. And I'm taking a specimen by uh, bringing down that orange part. Cool. And uh, next, next slide, please. Cool, that's one growing right next to the visitor center at Casper's on a hill, yeah, that's one of the bigger boys. Cool. Next slide, please. All right, this is Zeltner Venusta, or Charming Centauri. Um, they're in the Gentian Aceae, or the Gentian family. These plants are short annuals found close to streams, grasslands, and burn areas. Yeah, it was a very good year, that's why it's a good photo. It was a very good year for this plant. Uh, so as you can see in the picture, their anthers, which are their uh, male parts, they look a little weird. That's because their, answer, their anthers start going straight like normal flower, uh, but then they twist like a corkscrew into like a fusilli pasta shape. Uh, when it's time to shed their pollen, mm -hmm. it's kind of wringing it out and helping them get the pollen out. Yeah, and rarely they have a white variety that comes up. That's, uh, you can imagine it's basically the same flower but completely white. Yeah, uh, next, next slide, please. Awesome, this is Arandotheria chrysantha, otherwise known as golden eardrops. And uh, they're a very unusual plant in the poppy family, Popoveraceae. From afar, the plant may resemble a medium-sized tree tobacco, uh, but when you get close, the flowers, you see a sha uh, shape like the fleur de lis symbol. Uh, and also the, the leaves look sort of like that of Eschelzea talifoid or golden poppy. And the flowers are bright yellow. So they're found in lots of diverse regions of California, generally a year or two after fire. Uh, their seeds require exposure to chemicals leached from charred wood in order to trigger germination. And they're known to come up in dry slopes, burns, and disturbed areas. Interestingly enough, the two plants we found in the park were growing next to streams. Uh, yeah, and these flowers are in flower April to September. Cool. Next, next slide, please. Jim, I'm going to take a question right now. Okay. Uh, someone I'm... said they ran into poodle dog bush out near Los Pinos Peak. <clears throat> How likely are we to find that in Caspers? Uh, we, we have not found poodle dog bush in Caspers at all. Uh, my team probably doesn't even know it. It's a very large relative of Facilia, has the same kinds of toxins in it that get jabbed into your skin. Toxin goes systemic and ends up causing rashes all over the body. It's really pretty strong for people to have the reaction, but it's a phenomenally beautiful plant. 
So picture a facilia eight to nine feet tall. It's pretty spectacular. And there are hundreds of acres of it right now after the Holy Fire. I was just up looking at it at uh, Los Pinos Peak and other places. And um, native bees go crazy for its pollen and nectar. So the native bee populations have really uh, risen up, up there in the Santa Ana Mountains. Just stay away from it, don't let it touch your skin, but we haven't found it. Uh, Jim, you've got a question there to answer? Uh, let me check. Is Zeltner Venusta unusual for the park? It's so common in San Diego. Uh, yes, I believe it. Uh, it's it's an unusual. Uh, it's unusual for the park. It's not really a rare plant. It, it does come up in the park, I believe. Like, uh, but this year was spe like specifically really well for it. Yeah, if I can add to that, um, because I know our area, our county, pretty well. Uh, Casper's Park has the largest population of this plant in our region. Just huge, huge population, and really good year for it this year. Alrighty. Cool. And now I'm going to talk to you guys about the monkey flowers uh, of Casper's Park. We have seven species and three genera, so pretty diverse. Uh, and monkey flowers are in the Phrymaceae or the Lopsy family. So Jim, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm sorry, I need to interrupt just real quick. Um, make them a little shorter. We're starting to run out of time. OK. OK, just make it quick. OK. So the, this is uh, Diplicus australis, or southern bush monkey flower. Uh, it's the most common monkey flower in the park and most likely in our area. Uh, the Indian plants tend to have more uh, yellow-orange flowers, and the coastal, closer to the coast, they tend to have more red. And in the park, we see a great diversity of all the colors because uh, it's in the middle of its distribution. Uh, yeah, and in this picture, we can see it being parasitized by Castileja aphanis or coastal paintbrush. Cool. Next slide, please. Next is uh, Diplicus punicus uh, or coastal bush monkey flower. Coastal bush monkey flower can commonly uh, be seen in coastal sage scrub and chaparral habitats in the park. Uh, this species goes south through San Diego and into northern Baja California and is also on Santa Catalina Island outside of the park. Cool. Next slide, please. This is white throated monkey flower or Diplicus brevipes. Um, Excuse me. Yeah, white throated monkey flower. Uh, it's called the slope sema four. Uh, it stands upright and usually on a single stem uh, and sometimes may branch. It's probably called a sema four because uh, sema fours are kind of an alphabet using two flags. And because the flowers are so large for its body, it's sort of like showing its presence. Yeah, next slide, please. This is scarlet monkey flower, Erythranth cardinalis. Um, one of the one of the common plants of seeps, streams, and creeks in Caspers, and other streams in uh, the Santa Ana Mountains. The flowers are red orange and look as if they've been squished from the side. Uh, they're pollinated by hummingbirds, bees, and our state butterfly, the California dog. Next slide, please. All right, this is seep monkey flower, Erythranth guttata. Uh, beautiful annual monkey flowers with yellow corollas and uh, red dots on their lower lip. Uh, you can see that's next to my car keys. They're, they can go pretty small or um, the next picture over is actually almost bushy. So yeah, they're very pretty and very common, uh, pretty abundant in the park. Cool. Next slide, please. And then this is Erythranth floribunda, or slimy monkey flower. Uh, it also grows next to um, creeks and riparian areas. Yeah, and slimy monkey flowers um, grow low and are mostly covered with white hairs. They're visually similar to downy monkey flowers and sometimes grow together. And downy monkey flower, I believe, is the next one over. Yeah, uh, ne next slide, please. Yes, uh, Mimetanth uh, pilosa is the downy monkey flower and they're tiny in stature but can easily be seen showing off their small yellow blooms 
April to September in riparian areas with moist sandy soils. Uh, they have long, soft, and white hairs, just like the other flower, uh, all around their body. Uh, a good way to tell them apart is just to look at the leaves. The leaves are a lot less wide on uh, down the monkey flower than the other version. All right, and that's it for the monkey flowers on my part. Uh, I believe uh, Louis Chong is going to talk to us about Dudleyas. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Dudleyas or Live Forevers. Um, in in Casper's Wilderness Park, we um, there are five species that you can find, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll be talking about, I think the lance leaf uh, live forever. Is it gonna be on the next slide? <clears throat> Hello? Oh, next slide. Okay, actually it's gonna be the ladies. Um, ladies, um, ladies fingers live forever, which I actually have right next to me. Um, it's a beautiful plant. Um, we found this in two locations in Casper's Park. So one, we found it in the alluvial scrub, which is really awesome and really cool to see. And then what we also found on the East Ridge Trail, which is um, which was facing, I believe, east. Um, the slope was facing east um, on there. And they're very beautiful flowers. They have a beautiful pink, creamy flower. They're pollinated by insects and uh, bees. So they're just, uh, they're a great indoor plant. They're beautiful. They're a sight to see. Um, the next slide is gonna be, what's the next slide on? I think um, the lance, um, the lance leaves live forever. This one is very abundant. Um, you can find it in Orange County. You can find it in Southern, um, Northern California. You can find it in a lot of places. So this one's not super rare or anything, but it's always a delight to see because um, they have two color forms or, or, or not color forms, but um, like they can have red, um, a red stem to green stem. The yellows are very, too, um, the, the flowers are very yellow and tubular, which is really awesome. They are pollinated by bees or hummingbirds. And these, these just pop out of nowhere. And it's just amazing seeing them every time. And uh, the next slide should be, I don't know what the next slide is on, but it's another Dudleya. So it should be great. Um, is a many, uh, many stem live forever. This one, um, I've, I've actually found it in uh, other places around Orange County, but they're just really hard to find being so small. And they only um, really show during the, during the, like, uh, the early wet season or, or, our, or our early winter season. Um, they can, uh, the flowers, I mean, the leaves can be like a bright green or they can have like a red um, spotty tint to them. The yellows are like a electric yellow um, flower as Bob is pointing down there. I believe it's in some, uh, I believe that's a California sagebrush um, that it's in right now. Um, but I've found it on east facing slopes with uh, surrounded by uh, cactuses or apuntias. It's really cool. But it's a great type to see. It's really in common. Um, if you do know what the dried flowers look like, you can definitely find them. But they look so much better during the winter. Um, and the uh, next slide. This one is my absolute favorite. It's the most showy one. And it's the largest one. It's the Chalky Lift Forever. Um, as you can see in the name, um, it's, uh, I guess, the white powdery um, substance is um, farra or farinus, uh, like, like farra, it's like a, a white chalky powder. Is it possible to press slowly in plant, plant press? Yes, yes it is. Um, <clears throat> they're, although they're succulent, they're, they're, they're not as, I guess, wet as other cactuses or, or as like cactuses. So it's a pretty easy to um, press these guys. Um, we usually don't press the whole plant just because they take forever to grow or they're very slow growing. Um, but um, I think, uh, but the more common ones like uh, lance leaf live forever. Yeah, um, we press the whole plant, but most of them we just use uh, the flower stalk and uh, well, like a few leaves, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, so the, um, as you can see the flowers, these are the most showy flowers. They're bright red, they're hummingbird pollinated. Um, the flower stalk gets like a meter long. It's, it's something, it's a sight to see. And once you see it, you can never forget it. Absolutely beautiful. And the uh, next slide, please, <clears throat> is a sticky lift forever. So this one we didn't get to see, and unfortunately in Castor's Park, but Ron Vanderhoff did find it on the um, southern end, or like southern, I guess, um, southeast end of a Castor's Park. Um, and, and they're just absolutely beautiful. They, they do look like uh, the lady's fingers very much, but the biggest difference is that um, if you ever touch them, they're actually really sticky. 
Um, it's really cool um, to, to actually see them or like feel that in person. And the flowers are just bright pink, they can be red. They're uh, insect and then they're, they're insect and a bee pollinated. Um, and what's it called? And the really cool thing is the type specimen for this was actually found in Castor's Park, which is super cool. I didn't know that um, until uh, Bob, Bob told me about that. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, the next slide is going to be on um, the types of daughters that we have here. So in Castor's Park, we have two um, dominant or, or um, two species that we saw. So if you want to go to the next slide, it's going to be California daughter, and I'll be talking about that for um, a bit. So uh, California daughter, um, its host, its host, its usual host plant is going to be buckwheat. So you can find buckwheat in a uh, coastal sage scrub to alluvial. So it really ranges, but if you find buckwheat, it's most likely going to be there. Um, as you can see, the, the flowers are a beautiful white flower. The, um, it's, um, the hairs are super fine. And on the picture on the left-hand side, that is actually it parasitizing a um, land sleep lift forever, which is super awesome. Um, I guess uh, awesome and bad just because it's parasitizing the, um, the Delia, which I don't like, but at, at the same time, what? So it's just really cool. Um, like I said, it's, it's there's so many things on it. People, do, people have done a lot of studies on it and it's just a really cool plant. So we'll go to the next slide. The next slide is going to be on the Canyon Daughter. No, no, no. Uh, oh, never mind. Oh, my bad. No, never mind. So this is actually um, right, um, right around the entrance of Castor's Park. There's this huge patch of buckwheat near you know, the alluvial scrub, and there's just all this California daughter on it, and there's like flowers everywhere. This is on the um, on the end of it, so it's like kind of drying up, um, but it's really cool. It's kind of like a forever Halloween. From what um, I can tell, it's kind of like the little spider webs, which is really cool. So if um, I guess if you're in October, like if you want some spider webs, like might as well just put some daughter. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. And the uh, next slide, please. Um, okay. So this one's Canyon Daughter. So Canyon Daughter, um, from far away, they actually look very similar. Uh, but Canyon Daughter, it's so much thicker. It's it's more like spaghetti and noodly like, um, and it's the main host is going to be Laurel Sumac, and Laurel Sumac obviously likes a little different conditions. Um, you can find it in coastal sage scrub, or um, or, or I guess uh, uh, just just yeah. So so wherever you see Laurel Sumac, and like I said, Laurel Sumac lives in a little higher elevation, so that's where you can find like uh, I guess mm, Canyon Daughter. It's really interesting once you once you see it. It's one of those things where it's like, oh, I get the difference now. So just um, just look for something that's a little more thicker. I believe in the next slide, um, we are going, oh, never mind. Um, okay, so these are the flowers of the Canyon Daughter. The cool thing about Canyon Daughter is the flowers are actually a little more tubular versus the, um, versus the California Daughter, which is a little more compact and the flower petals actually like bend over. Um, the Canyon Daughter doesn't really, uh, the flowers don't really do that. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a sight to see. Like I said, it's, it's, you just have to look really close. Um, okay, next. And oh, it's lagging. Oh, this is a picture I was waiting for. So this is Maddie, and this is her um, being parasitized by the Canyon Daughter. And as you can see, um, like, like how thick those are. Like it, it's very thick, it's really noodle-like. Um, you can try eating it, I guess. It doesn't taste really good. It can taste like carrots, um, but they're a really cool plant. Um, I would look out for them if you ever go to Castor's Park. Just look for a laurel sumac and um, they might be on it. Or if you see a little yellow, yellow patches like out in the area, um, they'll be there. So Ken, uh, Kenyan Daughter is a little more orange than um, California Daughter, but those are the two uh, pair, um, the otters that we have in the Castor's Park, and they're absolutely amazing. So you should come out um, and uh, do what Maddie's doing and get engulfed by them. And we have Megan, um, uh, God, I can't pronounce this name, um, Puecart, did I say that right? It's fine, just, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about sages or salvias today. There's actually only three found in the park. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet, uh, sweet, just like the smell of our 
first stage, if we go to the next slide. Black sage. So this is actually one of my favorite all-time plants. I love the smell of the leaves. Um, they have, it's located in coastal sage scrub typically. Um, their flowers are a pale lavender or blue. They look almost white from a distance or can just look white in general. Uh, their leaves are a darker green. I believe the reason why they're called, the, the common name is black sage is because when the leaves die, they are a black color. Bob, can you back that or? Well, it's actually when the flowers are all done and in winter time, the flowering stalks look black, especially when they get oh, okay, water. that's what it was. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, it's still kind then, of a silly name. Yeah, I was kind of confused about that, but anyways, so yeah, and it just smells amazing. If you rub your fingers on the leaves, it smells great. Uh, and then for any of our birders out there, the lesser goldfinch actually snacks on the seeds in summer and fall of this plant. Okay, we can go on to the next one, being white sage. White sage is found, Salvia apiana is found in coastal sage scrub and chaparral habitat. It's actually normally a, a short bushy plant. However, its uh, flower stalks grow super long. Uh, they get very heavy and they tend to fall over just like you're seeing in that picture right there. Uh, they uh, and also the leaves are uh, much lighter than the black sage and I think a, a little bit longer and thicker as well in my opinion for what I've seen in the field. Um, and then they grow in higher elevation than black sage as well. We can move on to chia. I love this plant, it's super adorable. Um, so it's actually not the chia pet kind of chia also. <laughs> So this one grows in coastal sage scrub and chaparral habitat. Um, it looks much different than the past two stages that we just spoke of. Uh, it gives off a pale to bright blue or purple flower. Um, and then you can also eat the chia. Um, it's very high in protein. And um, the seeds of chia are very fire reliant. So uh, you'll see them You'll, you'll usually see them after like a good fire. Um, and then last thing I want to say about the chia was that they're known to hybridize with the white sage. I do not know what that looks like, but I wish I did. If anyone has pictures, perhaps they could share. I would love to know what that would look like. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I have to talk about with sage. So I would like to- No, well, not yet. Nope, nope. Couple questions for you. Oh, nice. Yeah. You want me to read them? Here, I can list them. Why wouldn't you find purple sage in Casper's? I'm not sure why we don't. Bob, can you answer that? Well, purple sage occurs in Santiago Canyon, uh, farther north from Casper's, mostly on north facing slopes. Uh, recently, Mike Simpson found uh, one plant, I think it is, in San Juan Capistrano, not too far from the park. So I think next year we're gonna redouble our efforts to try to find it. I can't think of any places that have appropriate habitat. The soils don't seem quite right. This Casper's is um, a lot of decomposed granite and sandy and alluvial soils where uh, purple sage seems to like more clay, at least here in Orange County. All right. And then the second one is this, the chia that you buy the seeds of in the store. I believe not if you're speaking of like the chia pet and stuff. No, it's not what they are. Totally different. All right, anything else? I don't see anything else. All right, now here's Maddie again to talk about lilies. Unmute myself. Um, <laughs> hi, again, um, I'm gonna talk about lilies. We have four species that um, occur in Caspers and we'll go to the next slide. So the first one is the Catalina mariposa lily, Calicordis uh, Catalina, Catalina, and it grows in coastal sage scrub and grasslands. So you, as you can see, it has a, uh, the petals are white, uh, really bright white, and then can vary. So on the outsides, it can be a little bit purple. And so you can see it in the middle picture and on the right side, the variation between the two. And then in the middle of uh, by the anthers. Uh, there's red splotches inside uh, 
And you can also see that there's hairs, little yellow hairs that are within those lilies. Uh, these lilies will uh, grow in grasslands and in coastal sage scrub. So in coastal sage scrub, it will grow within some of the other plants. So you'll kind of see it popping up out of uh, sagebrush or buckwheat. Uh, we didn't get to voucher any of these yet because they are a uh, late winter and uh, early spring flowering. So we started, uh, our group specifically started vouchering uh, in May. So we didn't get to voucher the Catalina Mariposa Lily or Catalina Mariposa Lily yet. And I'll go to the next one. Unless there's a question. And then the next one is the Splendid Mariposa Lily, uh, Calicorda splendens. And we, in it's a uh, or coastal sage scrub. And we saw this on the Eastern side of the park, but we did not uh, voucher that. And uh, characteristics, you can see that it has a very light purple uh, petal and uh, it has little uh, fibrous uh, fibers on the inside of the petals. And uh, this one doesn't really do it justice, but this photo, but the anthers can get really big and they're gorgeous. Like you can tell they're just popping out on the sides. Um, I have a few pictures of my own that are just amazing. And uh, these ones do the same thing. They'll grow in coastal sage scrub uh, along with other plants, uh, other bigger bushes of plants. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. And then this is Weeds Mariposa Lily, Calicordus weedii variation weedii. Um, so you can see here that uh, it has yellow petals on the inside. It has um, just lots of fibers on it. And then the anthers are huge yellow and it has uh, purple splotches on the inside. Uh, this will also grow in so, uh, coastal sage scrub and chaparral. And it is located on the north and northeastern section of the park. Um, and yeah, and so there's little spots on it, uh, little brown black spots that are within the whole entire uh, leaves, or not leaves, sorry, petals. And uh, we'll go to the next one, which is uh, a variation. So it's the intermediate mariposa lily. And you can tell there's a huge difference with the petals. There's the purple splotches that are on the side. Uh, and it's very hairy on the inside, just like the last one. But it's definitely the, the difference is with the just the, the weedy eye and uh, the variation intermediates. Uh, definitely the purple splotches, you can tell the difference between that. And this is located on the south and southwestern section of the park, so they both occur in different areas. So that helps a lot when trying to identify, um, if we do have a problem with identifying, seeing what part of the park we're in to see if it's the intermediate or the non-intermediate version. And we will go to the next slide. And I'm gonna take Maybe. it back to Bob. Okay, before I do that, you have a question. I don't know if you know the answer. Someone said there's surprise no chocolate lilies in the park. My team doesn't know what those look like. They're a dark brown lily, beautiful thing. They need to live in deep, deep clay. Casper's doesn't have a whole lot of deep clay, uh, but we, we're hopeful that we might find some of these. They are known from some places, oh, maybe 10 miles away. Um, but I'm pretty sure not known from the park yet, unless I totally miss it. Okay, so a little summary here. So we're just about done. We've got about 467 species, give or take. Uh, more work in the fall. We're going to come back for fall blooming species. They're actually doing some work on the park. We can't get into most of it right now because of some maintenance they had to do on the, the main road. But we'll be back to it soon to get those fall blooming species and come back in winter and spring to do even more and then publish the results. We're not sure when, maybe next year, just call it like a year study or two year study, but uh, certainly we are gonna publish those results. We're not sure where yet, but everybody will be part of that. We had a great question from someone asking about the panelists here and where are you guys from? And so these students, these are all students of mine at Orange Coast College. It's Community College in Costa Mesa here in Orange County where I teach. Um, so these folks are really very new to all this, and they just learned it all like a, like a sponge, sopping up water. So I'm really proud of them all. They've been fantastic and really learning a lot of field work and uh, learning all about, all about botany, doing our, uh, 
our, um, our field trips. Um, okay, hold on here. Yes, their names. Okay, Mike added their names on the official checklist online. Yay, thank you, Mike. And then, yes, Justin, I know they're all over Elsinore Peak. That is uh, like 10 to 15 miles away. Yeah, I know, I know exactly where that is. I think the photos of my wildflower book were taken on Elsinore Peak. Um, Ron says there's some Humboldt lilies. Ron's been hiding that fact from me. I don't know where they are. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, a lot of good stuff. Everybody's telling you you're great. Okay, yeah, okay. I think we got all those things. And so uh, let me remind everybody that the uh, Bug Bogs Flying Circus um, uh, things, our items, stickers and shirts and masks and mugs are all available at our Tea Public site, right? And no, we're not making money on it. We make like a dollar or something. <laughs> so I'll buy water for these guys or something. But it's just kind of fun. Um, let's see, hold on here. We got another question. I, I know it's a CNPS talk, but wondering if there were any unusual wildlife sightings during the botanical surveys. Uh, our last foray out, we saw a gray fox. It just yeah. calmly walked away from us. They're never walking toward you. They're always walking away. So I have a lot of good memories of gray fox tails going the other way. There are a lot of frog tadpoles. Uh, frog and like toad tadpoles everywhere. So like we're like step around the stream and we're like, oh, I don't want to step on any. Oh no, <laughs> ah. We did see some little tree frogs too and lots yeah. of butterflies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a great butterfly year. They're fantastic, everybody. Okay, we might have something here. Everybody's saying you guys did a great job. Oh, well, thank you guys. Also, thank you to Bob for inviting us to do this. Yeah. And, yes, uh, thank you, Bob. Us all the knowledge that we know. <laughs> yes. yeah. If if you guys ever have a chance, you need to go on one of his hikes or little, little trails because he will teach you a bajillion more things that you <laughs> ever have known. <laughs> yes, <laughs> maybe. <amazing. laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We've got one more question. Is there a way to photo with a phone of a California plant and have an identification made using artificial intelligence? Um, um, most of those apps were written by somebody back east, and they're not really good for California, but they are getting better, like Leaf Snap is getting better. Uh, also, you can take a picture of something using the iNaturalist app and post it through the app right there in the field, and people will jump in and tell you what it is. Part, some of the members of our team are incredibly active on that site. James Bailey is one of the top contributors to the entire iNaturalist system. He's part of the team. Uh, so is Ron Vanderhoff. They're amazing. Okay, let's see if we've got any other any other good questions here. Oh, I have a comment. It wouldn't have been possible without Bob's wildflower book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I always have it right in front of me just because um, it's good to see that. You never know. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, but yep, hopefully we'll cool. be talking more on this eventually. We're having our own talk, one of us, hopefully. I'm hoping on it. That's true. We do talk about a lot about this. Can we get the slides after this? Um, um, I, I, whatever YouTube posts, I'm not really sure. This is our first Zoom meeting sent to YouTube. So fingers crossed that it will work and it stores it, right, Joseph? Um, yes, yes, uh, there will be uh, a video available and the link sent out to the Zoom attendees tonight. And then that video is recorded on uh, Bug Bob's YouTube channel that some people are watching there. Um, well, I mean, this was an amazing presentation. I, everyone was so well integrated. And um, I thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Uh, you know, geocaching comes and goes, Pokemon comes and Pokemon goes, but plant surveys go on forever. And I, I, uh, in the audience, I, I see some plant surveyors uh, tonight. Uh, the, uh, our chapter president in San Diego, Justin Daniel, Maestros, Michael Simpson and Ron Vanderhoff and probably many others that I'm not familiar with. And, um, makes me, I've, I've not been on a plant survey, makes me want to go now listening to all of you. Um, and 
uh, yeah, as mentioned, if you want to learn more about the flora of um, that area in Orange County in the Santa Ana Mountains, um, you can read the book. I also have it. It's a uh, personally <laughs> plant book. Uh, I'll put the link where you can purchase it by mail while our chapters are not hosting physical meetings right now. And um, I'll, I'll put the link in. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send it out to people tomorrow. And the... Uh, the park is open for hiking, but temperatures are what in the nineties right now. Yeah, and they're high. Hot. So maybe yeah, hot. later in the year or, or or go when would you see the first blooms? January, February, maybe. Um, so um, uh, I want to mention that tonight we had two hundred and fifteen people watching this presentation between the two platforms. And it's so quiet. Um, we hope you enjoy this evening. At um, in our San Diego chapter, we'll be hosting uh, a couple more upcoming presentations. Um, I wanted to thank um, everyone that presented tonight, along with um, from Orange County, Brad Jenkins, the chapter president, Elizabeth Wallace, and Sarah Jane, and and San Diego County, our programs director, Tori Neal. Um, put in the chat section, we'll leave the room open for a little bit. You can uh, continue in chat or Q&A if you like. Uh, put any suggestions you might have for future talks or uh, even better, if you know speakers in our SoCal here who can talk about California native plants, you can also e email me at media at cnpssd.org. And um, that's it for tonight. So thank you so much, everyone. And thanks to our audience for uh, following along. Um, everyone in enjoy your evening. All right, thank you, Joseph. Good job, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Okay, take care. Yeah, you too. Do I like to sign off? Oh. Okay, you, sure. You can hang for a little bit. We're going to see if more <laughs> questions come in, so it's okay. <laughs>